Hello, everyone. My name is Gabrielle Hunter, and I am a Senior Technical Advisor for Malaria with the Breakthrough Action Project, led by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Welcome to today's webinar, Understanding Net Use, What Do Your Numbers Really Mean? This webinar is hosted by the Breakthrough Action Project. We're a USAID flagship project for social and behavior change. As we're a new project, we're very happy to welcome you to our very first webinar. We're also happy to co-host this webinar with the PMI-funded project VectorWorks, which will be introduced in a moment. Just a few reminders for our webinar today. We are recording the webinar, and we'll send the audio and presentation slides to everyone afterwards. All of the participants are on mute, except for the presenters. So you can submit your questions at any time by typing them into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. After the presentations are complete, the presenters will be able to respond to your questions at, in a question and answer session. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Don Dickerson. Don Dickerson is a senior malaria technical advisor on the PMI team at USAID Washington. He has over 30 years' experience in international public health, working in a number of African countries in the areas of malaria, HIV AIDS, family planning, and reproductive and maternal and child health. He previously served as the PMI resident advisor in Madagascar. In his current position, Don covers Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and Guinea for PMI. He is also on the PMI interagency SBC team. Thank you, Don, and welcome. Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, I think our uh, participants overseas will be happy to hear that we're having some connectivity problems here in Washington. So if I go out, um, our hosts are, are primed to take over. So I'm delighted to be here uh, as a part of this webinar today. USAID recognizes the central role that social and behavior change programs play in promoting behaviors to prevent malaria, such as sleeping under an insecticide-treated net every night. However, we also know that in order for people at risk for malaria to use a bed net, we must ensure access to nets. Access to nets. So only looking at an indicator that reports on the number of people sleeping under a net does not give the complete picture. How can we ensure good coverage of both nets and social and behavior change communication, or SBCC, to the right populations and at the right time to optimize both access to nets and use of them? Using DHS and MIS data, the PMI-funded VectorWorks project has developed an indicator that can help us address this question in our programming. The ITN use access ratio compares ITN use in the context of access to ITN. That is, of those who have access to a net, how many are sleeping under the nets? In other words, we are not including people who are not sleeping under a net because they live in a household where there are no or not enough nets. This ratio can help us better segment our audiences for SBCC programs and can also inform net distribution activities to ensure optimal coverage and promote net use strategically. We have two speakers today who will discuss this topic, and then we will have about 15 minutes at the end to answer your questions and respond to comments. First, I would like to introduce H Hannah Kunker, who Hannah has worked in malaria control for over 15 years and is a senior program officer at the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, where she is the program director for VectorWorks. VectorWorks is a project funded by PMI to increase access to and use of insecticide-treated bed nets for malaria prevention. Hannah provides global leadership on bed net policy issues to the World Health Organization, PMI, and the Global Fund. She has a PhD in epidemiology from the University of Basel, and an MPH from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today, Hannah will discuss various ITN coverage indicators, the use access ratio, and how we can use that data to better segment and target our program. Welcome, Hannah. Hey, good morning, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. So we will uh, first go through a few of the indicators uh, that we're using here. Um, we've got a few different terms that we use interchangeably in terms of our goal. So we have goals of universal access, we have goals of universal coverage for ITNs, um, but ultimately the goal is to have people using nets. 
So when we talk about coverage, uh, there are actually three different indicators for ITN coverage, or four if you include ITN use. So when we talk about coverage for ITNs in terms of ownership or possession, we need to look really carefully at the three different indicators that we have because they tell very different stories. And we'll walk through these three indicators right now. So to illustrate, uh, here we have a village that has five houses, and it's got 30 people. Um, there are 10 nets in this village, and they're interspersed throughout the houses. Um, and you can see that some people are do I have a pointer? Um, some people have some nets, and some people are not using their nets. Uh, yes, this person's not using their nets. Um, so in terms of the first indicator for ITNs that we use, the percent of households owning at least one ITN, all five of these houses have at least one ITN. So that's great. They have at least one. But we know that there's still not quite enough um, for everybody. So this ownership indicator of at least one ITN gives us a basic coverage indicator, but it doesn't tell us the full picture. When we look at the population access indicator, um, this is the percent of the population with access to an ITN, assuming that each net protects two people. So in other words, we can think about this indicator as portion of the population that could use an ITN. They have the opportunity to use one. So for example, in this first house, We've got two nets in here and seven people all together. So if each net protects two people, this net protects two people, this net is going to protect two people. So that's four potential net users in this household out of seven total people in the household. So we can say that four people out of this household, out of the, out of the seven people in the household, um, have the opportunity to use the net. They have access to an ITN. We don't know if they actually you know, which of these people in the household is going to use it or has actual access to it. We can't quite measure that. But we can say that within this household, four out of the seven people um, have the opportunity to use an ITN, and therefore they have access to an ITN within their household. The way that we think about this, or the way that we actually calculate this in the DHS and the MIS, is not to assign, you know, this individual here has access equal to 1, and this individual here has access equal to 0, because we don't know specifically in the household who has access. But we can use mathematics to help us calculate the um, percentage of the population across the entire sample that has access. And the way we do that is to say, for this particular household, we have four potential net users out of 7. And so 4 divided by 7 is 57%. And therefore, for each of the individuals in this household, they are assigned a value of 57% in the data set. For example, in the next household, they've got three nets. And so they've got six potential net users, six people with access, out of seven. And six divided by seven is 86%. So each of the individuals in this household has a value of 86% access. When we add up and then average, all of these values across the individuals in the data set, what we get is 63% of the population in this village, in this instance, have access to an ITN. And so it's roughly two-thirds of the people that could use a net in this village. Here, we don't know whether this person is actually using the net or not, but we've got two nets here, and therefore um, three people. So in principle, we have four potential net users in this household, <clears throat> but only three people. So if we divide four by three, we get a value over one. But we can't have extra access in this household because we can't assign, for example, this person over here to use this extra half a space in this net. That doesn't work. So for each of the individuals in this household, we cap their access at 100%. Access can't be over 100% within a particular household. So that's population access. Now, the other indicator that we often use, um, especially after universal coverage math campaigns, is the percentage of households that own at least one ITN for every two people. This is our household universal coverage indicator, and it shows how many households have enough nets for all of the people in their household. Now, in our example, the only house that, has, that meets this criteria, that meets this threshold, is this one. 
And it's no coincidence that this is a small household. Smaller households with three or four people or less are much more likely to be able to achieve ownership of at least one ITN for every two people in the household. The larger houses often miss out maybe just by one person, maybe by a couple people, and they don't qualify for this indicator. So this indicator really is a measure of perfect coverage, and it's very difficult to achieve perfect coverage. So the question is, are we doing well or not so well, depending on which indicator we look at? So in terms of the percentage of houses owning at least one ITN, that was 100% in our example, and so that's fantastic. But it doesn't really show that everybody has the opportunity to use a net. When we look at the percentage of the population with access to an ITN, that was only 63%. About two-thirds of the people in that village had access to an ITN. Finally, the percentage of the houses that own at least one ITN for two people was quite low. Only 20% of the houses in that village, only one out of the five, actually met this very um, ambitious criteria. So when we look at our different indicators for ITN coverage, we need to keep in mind that they tell very different stories. And because the population access indicator is based on people and not houses, this is the indicator that we try and focus on because it better represents individual protection or potential individual protection. And to illustrate again, <clears throat> each indicator has its limits and they tell different stories. So here we have in the blue line ownership of at least one ITN at the household level. So that, again, this is our minimal threshold of coverage. We can very often after a math campaign see this up in the 80% and 90% because we're doing a good job with the math campaigns, getting coverage broadly um, around and getting a few nets at least to every household. The percentage of people with access to a net, people that could use an ITN, always comes in the middle here and always kind of tops out around 70, maybe 80 percent um, right after a math campaign. That's the way it's currently we're doing things. And then this percentage of households that own at least one ITN for two people, which is our perfect coverage indicator, is much more difficult to achieve, again, because large houses always, almost always miss out by one or two nets. And so that tops out around, you know, it's been as high as 60 in some places, um, but it's very difficult to get it above 60%. And so after a mass campaign, um, programs really need to keep in mind that this indicator of houses owning at least one ITN for two people is not going to be as high as the other ones, and that's okay. Then, ITN use is driven by access. So I've added here this red line, which is the percent of the population using an ITN. And you'll see that it tracks very closely with this green line, which is population access. And I think the legend has gotten a little garbled here in the um, uploading of the presentation. But the red line is ITN use, the percentage of people using an ITN. And the green line is the percentage of people that could use an ITN. And you'll see that these are very close as we go up and up and up. So just a quick note to clarify how we ask about ITN use in surveys. Um, sometimes we are hear from partners and, and programs that they're worried about the ITN use question because if you just ask somebody if they used them at the previous night, of course they're going to tell you that they did. But this isn't the way that we ask um, this question in the surveys. And it's true that if you did ask that question in that way, it would bias the results. So instead, for each of the nets that are found in the household, um, the interviewers ask a series of questions about the brand, about where it was obtained, um, what color it is, et cetera. And then they're asked, for this net, did anybody sleep under this net last night? And then if the answer is yes, then the following question is, who slept under the net, this net last night? And then the line numbers of those family members are entered into the survey questionnaire based on the household listing of people in the household um, that had been done at the beginning of the survey. So that reduces the bias in, uh, in the ITN use uh, question. And then once that data is obtained and cleaned and prepped, then our friends at Measure DHS generate a new variable that says for each individual in the data set, um, did they or did they not use a net the previous night? So, the ratio of ITN access to ITN use, um, or the ratio of ITN use to ITN access in this case, um, is 
the indicator that really narrows down into the behavioral aspect of ITN use. We don't care about people that can't use a net because they don't have one. As FTCC people, we can't help them unless we get them a net in the first place. But we do care about the proportion of people that are using a net among those that could use one. So of the people who have the opportunity to use a net in their household, how many are actually using one? The way that we get this indicator is very simple. We divide the percent of the population that used an ITN the previous night by the percent of the population with access to an ITN. So this gives us a representation as an indicator of what proportion of people are actually using an ITN out of those um, who could use one. And that helps us narrow down onto the behavioral aspects of net use. So in the ITN Access and Use Report, which is always updated and available at um, www.vector-works.org in our resources section. We up this, update this about every month um, as new data sets come out, and we calculate ITN access, ITN use, and the ITN use to access ratio in order to provide information to 44 countries um, about net use behaviors in their countries. So we're currently at about 103 household surveys that are included, representing 44 countries. We include um, interpolated maps for PMI focus countries, which is in a PowerPoint file at that same uh, web address that I showed you earlier. And like I said, we update this really often. I have a new update for February sitting in my inbox that we just need to review and post. So in this report, we look for patterns and trends across mainly the ITN use to access ratio. So we look by region and province. We look across wealth quintiles. We look at differences between urban and rural residents. And then we also take into account in the commentary that we provide um, information on timing for the data collection, whether it was raining or not, recent mass campaigns that might have um, boosted coverage in terms of population access, and then some observations on the data and the programmatic implications for SDCC. So to sort of note, geography is really important. And this map is a map of the ITN use to access ratio. So it's really a map of behaviors. It's not a map of who could use an ITN. It's a map of who is using an ITN among people who could use an ITN. So anything that's green here is great. Above 0 0.8 as a ratio for uh, ITN use among those with access is really fantastic. DRC is looking really good. Um, all down here is looking really good. Tanzania mostly looks great. Madagascar is always fantastic. They do a really great job of using the nets that they have. And most parts of Sub-Saharan Africa that we're measuring are also doing pretty good. Now, we can identify some red zones here. So here in Guinea is the Futajano region, where it's a little bit higher. Pristine is a little bit lower. And there may be some other differences driving down net use. The yellow areas here in the Sahel tend to be driven by seasonal patterns, dry season where it's hotter and there's fewer mosquitoes around. And so there's less net use among people who have the opportunity to use nets. Here in Nigeria in the south, we have um, a lot more urban areas, particularly Lagos, um, where there's not a lot of malaria. And people have screen windows and maybe air conditioners to a greater degree than other areas. And in Zimbabwe, we have some challenges here in this particular survey, as well as in southern Mozambique, which is dating back to 2011. So this represents the most recent survey from any of these, all of these countries. But we need to look in more fine detail to see what exactly is going on and where, because that will help us understand how we want to target. So in terms of the report itself, just to show you quickly what we have, the beginning starts off with a big table as a national result. So for each of the surveys we present, the main indicator for percent of households owning at least one ITN, population access uh, for that country, population use, and then the ratio of use to access, which is really just this indicator divided by this indicator. And you'll note that we have color coding here. So again, green is good. Yellow is kind of mediocre. And then red is, is needs a lot of work. Um, and values over one <clears throat> in this column indicate that on average, more than two people are sharing an ITN. So in a lot of countries, we do see this go over one, uh, Madagascar in particular, where you have um, a lot of kids crammed in under um, a same net. 
Then for each country, we provide a little bit of background at the beginning on the survey fieldwork timing and the rainy season timing. And then we present the same indicators for each of the surveys that we have available. So for Uganda, we've got the 2009 MIS, the 2011 DHS, and the 2014 and 15 MIS as well. And then we've got household ownership of at least one ITN, population access, population use of ITNs, and then the ratio. And we keep the, the ratios here color-coded so that you can see at a glance if there are any trends um, and patterns. And so for the first part of this table, we break it out by region. So you can see which of the regions is doing well, which of the regions might need a little bit more help. Then moving down into the same table, we start looking at wealth quintile trends and then urban rural trends. And then we have calculated IRS here, but um, it's on a national scale. And so to be honest, I don't think it's that useful as a, as a comparison. But we can start to see here, for example, in 2011, the poorest, quintile in Uganda was really doing a much better job using nets when they had access to them than some of the wealthier quintiles. That seems to have evened out um, a little bit. At least everybody's all in the green here, although the poorest quintiles um, are using the nets when they have them to a greater degree. And then at the bottom here, we include some observations about what we feel is happening and some brief programmatic recommendations for what countries may wish to focus on. We also include maps, and this is just, again, um, a small map for the Mozambique DHS 2011. We are excited about the EMA-CEDA coming out from Mozambique, which will give us some fresh data for this. Um, but you can see, again, down in the south, we have uh, more problematic areas. There's lower parasitemia here. There's been more IRS um, and you know, it's bordering South Africa. So there's very different behavioral patterns in southern Mozambique than up in the north, um, where things look a little bit better. So in terms of trends, we have a couple key questions. So first, are people using nets, um, which is still a question that we get? Are families still prioritizing under fives and pregnant women? Are people using nets all year round? Are the most at-risk people using ITNs? And then what are the determinants of ITN use after we've actually controlled for access? So we'll go through these. So are people using nets? Yes. By and large, in most countries, most of the time, people are using nets when they have access to them. But we need to look in more detail. We can't just take our national estimates and use that for planning. We need to look at the whole country, different parts of the country, and different regions to see what's going on. So the second question is, are families still prioritizing under fives and pregnant women? And VectorWorks has done a couple different things on this. We have a published paper, and we have one in the works as well. And I wanted to walk you through this graph because I think it does illustrate some of the key factors that are going on. So this is a <clears throat> graph from the DRC 2013-14 DHS. We've got a few sets of lines here. So across the bottom, we have age groups. So 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15-year-olds, 15, 15 to 20-year-olds, et cetera. Along the y-axis here, this is the, po the proportion of the population using an ITN. This doesn't control for access but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. This is just the proportion of the population actually using an ITN. So we see that for, in these dotted lines, these are households that have at least one ITN, but not enough ITNs. They don't own one ITN for two people. And so in these households where they have some but not enough nets, we see that under five have some of the highest use rates, as do um, adults. And in particular, this purple line are women. So women of reproductive age from about 20 on upwards are prioritized for ITN use when there aren't enough ITNs in the household. So men are a little bit deprioritized. And in particular, our older children also have lower rates of net use because if there's only a few nets in the household, those potential spaces are going to be filled up by the under fives and by the adults first, and then the teens and some of the older folks um, won't have as much of an opportunity. Now, when we look at houses that do own at least one ITN for two people, we see that those discrepancies really flatten out. So there's no difference in the gender here. Uh, I don't have confidence intervals, but you have to trust me on that one. Um, there is a little bit of a dip a down for the teenagers here, because even when you have one ITN for two people, 
you still might not have enough for all the teenagers in your household, especially if they need to have separate sleeping spaces um, or if they're sleeping in a different, a different structure, for example. But once you have enough nets in the household, you really see the discrepancies both in age and gender flatten out. And that tells us that access to ITNs is really the key way to boost ITN use. I also want to note that in DRC, for those that have enough nets, ITN use is up high at around 90%. And again, that reflects the really great um, use behaviors in DRC. So our third question is, are people using nets all year round? And yes and no. So we have done an analysis over many of the PMI countries, uh, which is in the process of being written up as a manuscript and was presented at ASTMH last year. For a lot of countries, actually, particularly where there are at least where, where there are two dry, two rainy seasons, we see that, for example, in DRC, the ratio of ITN use to ITN access is pretty stable over the course of the year. And we can look at this by taking a couple different surveys. So the blue line here is 2007. Orange line here is 2013-14. But you can see this stays pretty high at close or above uh, about 80% um, use among those with access throughout the months of the year. And down at the bottom, we've got some indication of when the rain is falling in different places. For Mali, um, we've got a single rainy season. And it's a little bit different in Bamako here in blue than in the more northern areas, or western areas in Kai. Um, and ITN use, given access, is really quite high in Mali for most of the year. Back in 2006, um, it seemed to dip down in the dry season. And so you have this stronger seasonal pattern of ITN use where it kind of dips down during the dry season and then goes up again and is fairly high in the high transmission season and then may tail off a little bit as things dry out and mosquitoes disappear. So this is a, another interesting thing that we need to look at in terms of seasonal patterns of net use. So to illustrate maybe quickly for Senegal, um, we've got a continuous DHS in Senegal, so we have a lot more months of nice data there. So we've done the color coding on the map here in terms of the dry season. You can see that everything's kind of red over here and yellow, not too great. As we go into the early rainy period, um, things start to green up in terms of the ITN use to access ratio. So of people who have access to a net, use is starting to improve. We still have some yellow areas here in Seju and Kolda and Tambacunda. But by the time the late rain period arrives, everything is really green, um, except for Dakar, where we have you know, the capital city urban area, um, a lot more air conditioners, fans, electrification, and a little bit lower parasitemia as well. So we may have some problems in Senegal. In Dakar, one of the questions is, how much do we want to work on that, um, on that challenge, and how much gain will we get in terms of malaria transmission reduction? So, Question four, are the most at-risk people using ITNs? So obviously, we're really concerned with uh, groups of people that have less uh, access to healthcare in general, the rural population, the poorest wealth quintiles. And when we look at the seasonality graph um, in Ghana, we can break it out also by wealth quintile. So we've got the poorest wealth quintile here, and so the use of ITNs among those with access in the poorest wealth quintiles is pretty high, it's close to 80%. It does drop down a little bit as um, the rain stops. But the poorest quintile here in Ghana is really, they're really using their nets um, to a great degree when they have the opportunity to do so. Where we see the big drip drops here are in the highest wealth quintile. So in these richer, richest wealth quintiles, they are not using nets to the degree that we want them to. They may have other sources of protection. They may have other um, ways of accessing treatment that they feel is sufficient in terms of managing malaria for themselves. They may not feel at, at risk um, to the same degree of getting malaria. And so we can use this also to help stratify um, some SBCC interventions. So what are the determinants of ITN use once you've controlled for access? And in the regression analyses that we've done, it really comes down to the season that the survey is conducted. That makes a big difference in what the use behaviors look like. And this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody 
um, particularly in the Sahel, we do have significant drops in ITN use behaviors um, once the mosquitoes disappear and things dry out. Secondly, the region, um, and this has a lot to do with the malaria transmission profile of particular regions within the countries, um, the elevation uh, of particular regions, and essentially the, the malaria risk. And then finally, the wealth quintile is a big factor, particularly for Nigeria and for Ghana. So <clears throat> what are the gaps that we have? Uh, so we have a very busy plot here, which I will break down for you. So on the y-axis, we're plotting uh, regional parasitemia um, as measured with RDTs for children 6 to 59 months. So this is malaria parasitemia. Um, Plasmodium falciparum parasitemia plotted on the y-axis. And then along the x-axis, we have the proportion of people that use the net among those with access. So this is our use to access ratio along the bottom. This is our behavioral indicator. I'm not trying to make an association, a causal association, between the level of parasitemia and ITN use and access behaviors. But we will use this to sort of stratify and see where are our um, problem areas. Um, and the plots here represent um, subregions within a country. So, for example, here's Gaza in Mozambique. This is in the southern region of Mozambique. It's uh, quite low on the youth behavior indicator, um, and then the parasitemia is also around 20%, um, just to kind of orient you guys. So if we only look at dots uh, from surveys between 2014 and 2017, we have a little bit easier time seeing what's going on. And so here we've got some dots for Accra in Ghana, um, in Jombe region in Tanzania, which is above 2,000 meters altitude, so not a lot of malaria there, not very good ITN use behaviors here. So we can kind of stratify using uh, these quadrants. And I'll start over on the right-hand side in this green bubble. So everywhere where ITN use among those with access is over 80%, we're doing a good job and the people there are doing a good job. There's not a lot of room for improvement, to be quite honest. Um, to boost you know, from 80 to 90 might take a lot of work um, and may not provide all that much gain in transmission reduction. So in all of these areas, we need to keep up the good work, regardless of the parasitemia level, um, and look at maintaining those ITN use behaviors, um, maintaining ITN distribution activities, so that people continue to have access to nets. And looking at some care and repair um, or net maintenance behaviors so that people can maintain their nets for a long time in between distributions. There may be some reason to look up at the higher parasitemia places and see if there's um, you know, residual transmission or some outdoor sleeping or some other factors that may be continuing to contribute to high parasitemia. Is access to treatment a real challenge in these areas? And is maybe that still um, driving some of the high parasitemia. But in terms of net use behaviors, we're going to have a hard time making a lot of gains um, on top of what people are already doing. So they're doing a great job here, which is why this is green. Then sort of segmenting into high parasitemia and mediocre ITN use behaviors, um, there's a lot of malaria risk here. And so we do need to focus on the regions that fall into this segment. Um, so that we can help to improve uh, malaria control. And here, you know, we need to focus on segmenting the audiences to figure out what messages will resonate with them to improve ITN use, looking at the seasonality patterns. Are these surveys done in the dry season and then in the rainy season? These regions actually move into this quadrant. All these things are things that we can look at and continuing to emphasize the net care behaviors. Then for the slightly lower um, parasitemia levels, um, particularly you know, below 20 percent, uh, we need to further segment the regions here and see who are the most at-risk populations within the regions in these quadrants. Is it just the urban areas um, that, are, that are keeping these dots down? Do we need to focus in on particular subregions uh, within each of these countries? A little bit more work needs to be done to, um, to figure out exactly how you want to target your messaging to which populations within the regions here. And then we've, over here, we've got sort of this orange spot. This is parasitemia under 20%. Uh, 
ITN youth behaviors are not great. So again, greater Accra in 2014, greater Accra in 2016, it's hard to get people in greater Accra to use their nets. Um, and parasitemia is quite low, and they have quite good access to ACTs when they need them. So it may not be worth um, a lot of uh, programming to try and boost that here. You may not see a lot of gains in malaria trans transmission reduction. Same for Njombe down here, high altitude, low parasitemia. Um, it may not be worth the effort. But that allows you to focus your resources on some of these um, segments over here. And then just a flag that this is really good news that this quadrant is empty. This is the high parasitemia and low ITN use behavior quadrant, and it's empty. So that's great. Um, if we had any regions here, it would be big trouble. It would mean that we had really high parasitemia and people not using their nets, and we would have to do a lot of work to get them to boost that net use behavior. Right. So in terms of using the data for programming, just a couple slides here. Um, so we can look at segmenting the way we just did. We can also look at segmenting in terms of ITN access and ITN use. So along the ITN access uh, quadrant, as ITN access is high and ITN use uh, given access is also high, what we really need to do is just continue providing nets because we know that people will use them and perhaps focus a little bit more on net care to help extend ITN lifespan between campaigns. If we go in counterclockwise fashion, in areas where we have low ITN access, but the use behaviors are quite good, again, we need to get more nets out there because we know people will use them and promote net care to extend ITN lifespan between campaigns, making sure that when we distribute those nets, we are fully serving those large families so that ITN access can be really high for everybody. Um, use behaviors. We need more nets, clearly, um, but also targeted social behavior change uh, communications on those specific barriers for use. And here we want to make sure that we check the seasonal patterns, the wealth quintile use patterns, and emphasize year-round use. And basically the same thing, even where access continues to be high, we want to make sure we're providing nets, but making sure that we are targeting the specific populations where the use access ratio is low. So again, seasonal patterns, wealth quintile patterns, and emphasizing year-round use. And we can look at this in terms of a whole life strategy, um, in terms of a campaign cycle for, uh, for ITNs. Here in the orange, we have uh, population access illustrated um, here for ITNs. You do a mass campaign, population access to ITN goes up really quickly, and then it declines over time as people's nets wear out. So the SBCC cycle can be, you know, we need to do some IEC at the beginning of the campaign to encourage high participation in the campaign registration process, which is a key determinant of how well a campaign does at boosting high coverage. Then in the post-campaign period, there's some reminders about using the nets. And again, this will depend on what your overall use access, use access ratio is. Um, but focusing on those prompts and those reminders to keep using those nets, particularly as the rainy period comes and the high transmission season comes. And then in that first year, really focusing on net care SBCC to encourage retention of the nets and good care of the nets so that they last through this full three-year cycle. Then as you go along into year two after the campaign, another rainy season comes. You may want to do some limited punctual SBCC to promote use ahead of the high transmission season. Um, if people are already doing this, you might be able to do some more specific targeting and just focus on some of the lower uh, use access ratio groups. And then if dry season use is a problem, you could do some punctual SBCC in the dry season as well to try and boost the rates of ITN use among those with access in the dry season. Then moving into the third year after the campaign, again, this punctual SBCC to promote use ahead of the high transmission season, and then you start moving into preparations for the next campaign using IECC, IEC to encourage high participation. You'll notice that we don't include any hang-up activities here. Um, physical hang-up doesn't provide much of a boost at this point, especially in any areas on that map that were green. Um, PMI doesn't recommend hang-up activities, um, although we know that interpersonal communication can be quite effective. Uh, the actual physical hang-up is not needed. People can definitely hang up their nets on their own by this point after multiple campaigns, especially in most of the PMI countries. 
So I will stop there. Um, and that's my contact information. I will hand it over to uh, Don. OK, thank you, Hannah. Um, we'll move into our second presenter, uh, which is Ferdinand Antoya. Ferdinand is a Congolese medical doctor with about 20 years' experience on public health and primary health care. Prior to joining USAID PMI, he has been working for uh, the PSI affiliate in uh, DR Congo and then worked for Sea Change as a project coordinator. His technical areas of expertise are malaria and SBCC. Ferdinand will share with us recent experience incorporating the ITN use access ratio into the DRC National Malaria Communication Plan and some reflections on how the country will continue to use this data to implement their malaria SBCC activities. Welcome, Ferdinand. Hello, everyone. I will just take uh, a few minutes to share with you our recent experience in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, these, these data are from uh, DHS national surveys and uh, the graph indicates that net access and uh, net use have increased significantly from uh, 2007 to 2014. The ratio of uh, net use to net access has remained stable during this time with a ratio of just uh, over one. This indicates that in DRC, where there is access to net, they are being used. And often more than two people report sleeping under a net the previous night. We believe this means that a culture of net use exists in uh, DRC. When we examine the net use by age group, we see that it's lowest lowest in the 5 to 14 age group. The country partners have decided to distribute bed nets to school children through, school, through schools to help increase the ownership of net among this group age. We also understand that additional uh, bed nets are needed to increase access. Finally, we understand that it's important to maintain net use and uh, net care behavior through the DRC, uh, our, through our the, the SBC, through our SBCC, when additional bed nets are distributed. What does this data imply for our programming? Our new communication plan uh, encourages the adoption of malaria preven pre prevention behavior with a strong emphasis on the maintenance of the existing culture of net use so that net use remain a high. The plan also focuses on the adoption of net care behavior to ensure long ITN lifespan. The reach to reach to reach the group with lowest net use, the communication plan uses school children as main audience and channel to broadcast message message for net use and care. This is just a brief example of how this data can be used to inform your malaria programs. We hope to monitor the, the net use 
there is a net use access over time so that we can uh, be aware of any changes in the net use and access while we roll out our program. If we see changes, we can modify our strategy accordingly so this data will continue to be useful for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Ferdinand. We now have time for a few questions. I'm going to ask Gabrielle's session. Thank you, Don, and thank you to all of the presenters. We do have a few questions. Why don't we begin with um, a question to Hannah. Um, Mukhtar asks, in a situation where a woman has multiple children, say three, and they share the same net, how can that be described or calculated? Hannah, do you have any thoughts to share on that? Yeah, um, I think you know when we look at these indicators, we're taking them across the population sample. So for a particular region, a particular country, um, if the three children are sharing the same net with their mom, that's that's great. Uh, that will be reflected in the ITN use indicator. And while technically, if they're all sharing one net, um, you know their their access to ITNs is fifty percent for that household because if they have one net um, and four people, that's two potential users divided by four total people. So that's fifty percent access for each of them. Um, they will have really high use to access ratio within that household, um, but that's okay. They end up going into the broader mix across the sample and, um, and you know, if a lot of other houses are also putting in a lot of children under nets or having more than two net users on average, we will see quite high use to access ratios. Um, I think that reflects the importance of the net use behaviors um, if people are trying to get as many children as possible in under a net, uh, that's great. Um, and it shows that they really value uh, the utility of that net. Thank you, Hannah. Our next question is from Cletus, who says, I think this makes, that makes a case for the hang-up strategy, which ensures that as many people within a household as possible are using the net. Um, Hannah, you did make a point already about the hang-up strategy. Um, anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if Cletus means uh, like door-to-door -door distribution strategy for nets during a campaign um, or, or a post-campaign hang-up visit strategy. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence from Uganda and Togo and elsewhere to show that the physical hang-up visits don't do much to actually get additional nets hung up. Um, people don't always hang up their campaign nets right after a math campaign because they often have a few extra nets from before that they're still using. And it's OK if they continue to use those until they're ready to use the new campaign nets. Um, but in places, you know, again, where on that big map of Africa the, the zones were green, we don't need to spend resources helping people hang up their nets. People are using nets when they have them to a very high degree, and they've figured out how to do that. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from um, Jen Hutain asking about uh, introducing bias in the questionnaires when we ask people whether they slept under the net the previous night. And so this is um, more of a clarifying question. Why does this introduce bias while asking the suggested order of questions does not? Um, so, and the, the question is asked because in the context of limited resources, it's time sensitive to ask about every net. Right. So the RBM Monitoring and Evaluation Reference Group developed the standard um, net roster and malaria questions that help us to standardize how surveys are conducted um, about malaria and in particular about nets and net use. So if you are doing a malaria survey, <clears throat> it is incumbent upon you to use those standard questionnaires that have been developed by the RBM Monitoring Evaluation Reference Group. 
in order to get comparable information to what is collected um, in an MIS or DHS, or at least ask the questions in the same way. These have been tested. They have been worked over by experts. And the net roster is really the best way to ask about these questions. We find that with good training, it doesn't take that much time um, to ask about each net. And if you don't ask about each net in your household survey, then you don't know which net anybody is using. Um, and that can really make your results problematic. I've reviewed a lot of papers where they have asked the question directly um, and not taken into account how many nets are in the household, and it's very challenging to have um, good data out of those. So while it is a little bit more time intensive to ask about the style of the net and the users of the net in each house, of each net in each house, um, it is the best way that we have to, to get this information. Thanks, Hannah. Um, a few more questions for Hannah before we move into some questions for Ferdinand. Um, so Hannah, Ned asks if there's a possibility that people sleep under a net not because they are protecting themselves from malaria, but because they want to have peaceful sleep with no mosquitoes. Do we have any data on motivation for sleeping under nets? This is a great question. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, there is not a lot of published data on motivations for using nets. Um, we had done a small study in Zanzibar, and I think there's a few others um, that do reflect you know, what you've noted here. People do want to have a peaceful sleep with no crawling things, regardless of what species they are uh, bothering them. Um, but there hasn't been, you know, we don't ask in the surveys. We are starting to ask in the surveys about reasons why people aren't using a net if the net wasn't used that night. But we aren't asking people why they are. Um, and so there is, uh, you know, some links that we can make between the reasons that they're not using nets when there's no mosquitoes around and indicates that if there are a lot of mosquitoes around, people are more motivated to use nets. Um, if it's too hot to sleep under a net, then when it's not so hot, people are a little bit more motivated to sleep under nets. Um, but I think it is worthwhile as we move towards, um, you know, better malaria control to think about non-malaria reasons that people need to keep using nets. If malaria goes down and that's the sole reason people are using the nets, um, then they won't be motivated to keep using them once malaria is pretty much has, has been reduced. So we need to help message on these other uh, benefits of net use that have nothing to do with malaria so in order to, to sustain those behaviors. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Fernand, we have a few questions for you. Um, Mukhtar asks, why are the under 14s not using nets? Uh, was there any survey done to find out why? Ferdinand, do you have any more insights about this age group? Uh, yes. Uh, 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 the, the, we don't have a, a special uh, survey about this, but uh, when we look at uh, our uh, national survey, the HF, we can uh, notice that in that uh, age group, uh, we have uh, a high rate of uh, fever uh, and also a low rate of uh, access. Because as you know, we DRC uh, uh, op uh, opted for, for uh, a mass campaign distribution uh, at the community we, uh, through household. And uh, when we don't have uh, uh, more bed net in the household, so at that time, the children under five and the pregnant women are prioritized. So we uh, we forgot the the that group that is also vulnerable. That is why in uh, the country. NMCP and partner decided to, to target this group in, uh, in case to, uh, to, to increase access to, for, uh, of bed net for this uh, age group through school-based distribution. And we assume that uh, once 
the access is increased, also the use will be increased. Thanks, Ferdinand. And a very related question is whether the uh, low net use between 5 to 14 years uh, may be because of uh, such a large focus on net use among um, under 5 and pregnant women. This is a question from Peter. Um, do you believe that that's, that is related? Yes. Uh, 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 as I was saying, the uh, DFC uh, distribute net through campaign. So in the campaign, all popula the population are targeted. But we notice that in that special age group, the use is uh, lower than others. So we assume that the access is also lower. Because when we don't have enough bed net in a household, in that case, the, in that case, the children under five and pregnant women uh, was, uh, become prioritized. So to, to fix that problem, we try to increase access to those uh, children aged from five to uh, 14, so in the primary school. And uh, we assume that once the, the, the access to bed net is uh, increased, and then the use also will be increased. Since there is a good uh, culture of you, bed net, uh, net use uh, in the country. I think Ferdinand makes a really important point here, and I want to make sure everybody's clear on this. I was trying to get back to the graph with the purple lines on it. People can't use a net that they don't have. Um, and the teenagers often don't have a net within the household to use when the household doesn't have enough nets. That graph with the purple lines on it, the purple and gray lines, shows that once you have enough nets in the household, the teenagers use nets as much as anybody else in the household. So the factor really is access um, to nets among that age group rather than some sort of behavioral problem that the teenagers have. Um, and I think we really need to be careful about blaming people for not using nets that they don't have the opportunity to use. Um, we need to be able to identify people that aren't using nets when they do have the opportunity. But we need to be careful that we're not blaming specific groups like teenagers down here, sorry, down here, for not being able to use a net because they don't have one in this in these households. There aren't enough nets for them. Um, and I think it's good and it shows the power that SDCC has had over the past 15 to 20 years of emphasizing um, you know, the importance of making sure that under five and pregnant women are protected. Um, but we need to do a better job making sure that everybody and you know all households have enough nets so that everybody has the opportunity to use one. Thank you, Ferdinand and Hannah. Excellent points. Um, I think we've got time for just one last question. Um, this is a question for Hannah. Um, in the MIS, if 75% self-report having slept under an ITN the previous night, what can we assume there is a real percentage taking into consideration bias? And this question was from Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, so. There was a study a few years ago done by Benjamin Kudu of Liverpool. Uh, I think it was done in Cote d'Ivoire. And they used a net motion sensor to track the relationship between self-reported net use the previous night, um, self-reported net use three weeks prior, 10 days prior, and a month prior. And the net motion sensor recorded you know, when people were getting into and out of the bed and whether you know, they had used the net <clears throat> in principle. So while people had overestimated their net use when they were asked about their net use the month prior, or three weeks prior, or 10 days prior, based on what the net motion sensor actually had recorded, the correlation between 
self-reported net use the night before and the data recorded in the net motion sensor was the same. So there wasn't any difference um, in self-reported net use versus um, objectively measured net use for the night before the survey question. And I think that gets overlooked um, by a lot of people. Um, it is, you know, if we were asking people directly, again, did you sleep under a net last night? Um, that is a biased question. It's a leading question. And so if we don't ask the question that way. We try and come at it from the net point of view, and that helps to reduce a lot of that bias. Um, the KUDU study shows also that people do self-report um, net use the previous night to the same degree as we can objectively measure it. There's a lot more um, efforts going on now to try and see what portion of the night are people spending under a net. Um, you know, we don't have a good way in the survey questions right now to measure, you know, how many hours of the entire night were people um, under the net, and that is a, a challenge that we need to address in terms of residual transmission and some other gaps. Um, but <clears throat> I don't think we can say that, you know, if ITN use in the MIS is 75 percent, that there's a certain amount of bias that we can calculate. A, we can't calculate it. B, there's no data to support that um, there is there would be a bias difference based on the on the Liverpool study. So I'm interested in talking with people who um, who have uh, who have other opinions on this because I think it is it is a challenge that we have to face as a malaria community. But um, I can follow up with you offline. Okay, thank you, Hannah and Ferdinand, for your presentations today, um, and, th and thank you to Gabrielle for moderating the question and answer session, and thanks to all the attendees for your participation. Um, it's wonderful to see a lot of interest in this in this area. Our time is up for today, but you can send any follow-up questions or comments to the email addresses you see on the screen. You can also watch a YouTube video about the ITN use access ratio at the link provided here. Please take a minute to answer a few poll questions on the screen. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts about today's webinar with us. And we will send out an email with today's slides and the recording shortly after the webinar. Thank you all for attending and have a good day. Bye-bye.